We will be recording this webinar. Uh, just want to make sure everybody's aware of that. We um, will be going for an hour this afternoon. And if you have a question, please use the little question feature on your GoToWebinar uh, control panel. Um, toward the bottom of your control panel, it says questions. If you click on that, you can post a question. Because we have so many attendees in today's webinar, um, we're not going to unmute everyone because that could create a lot of background noise or confusion. We'll, we're asking people as the presenters go through their presentation slides that you post questions and then we will moderate those questions and hopefully get through as many questions as we possibly can in the time available. If you have any kind of uh, something that's not a question, you're having maybe some technical problems or other issues and you need to connect with us, please use the chat feature box at the bottom of the GoToWebinar uh, control panel, and we'll try to respond to those as the webinar progresses. So again, thank you to all of our distinguished presenters. We're going to start today with Lorenzo Macaluso. He's Director of Client Services at the Center for Ecotechnology, or CET, and he's been there since 2000. He's a national expert on business waste reduction systems and commercial energy efficiency solutions. He works with government, foundations, and industry partners to develop award-winning diversion solutions to help businesses and institutions reduce waste, save energy, and improve environmental performance. He has helped develop and oversee CET's green business services, providing waste diversion and energy efficiency information and technical assistance to a wide range of businesses throughout Massachusetts and southern New England. And he began his career at the University of Massachusetts Office of Waste Management in 1997. He has a Master's of Public Health with an environmental health focus and a Bachelor of Science in Natural Resources Management both degrees from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Thank you. Oh, before I switch to Lorenzo, you should be able to see up right now a web page. Just wanted to make you aware that we've posted the presentations for today's webinar on this web page. So you can go, if you want to view the PowerPoint slides, you can go to this web page and um, see both. They're hyperlinked here. I'm going to turn it over to Lorenzo. Thank you. Thank you. OK, I'm just uh, getting the PowerPoint to go to full screen. All right, it's up for me, Terry. Is it working for you? Can you see the? Um, First slide. I, I can see your first slide. Thank you. Looks Perfect. like it's Just good. To confirm. Okay. Well, um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you uh, so much for, for joining this webinar. And, and thank you to NERC and NUMOA um, for, for putting this, this together. Uh, two really great organizations that uh, we are all um, based here in the Northeast. And, and it's, it's great to collaborate on, on this effort. So I appreciate that, that opportunity. Um, so we're, we're talking today about uh, opportunities to, to divert food waste and, and especially for, for donation. And, and so for a little bit of background on our organization, we are the Center for Ecotechnology. We're an environmental nonprofit organization who's been around for over 40 years. And we've got about 70 professionals on staff that focus on helping people and businesses save energy and reduce waste. And we've been working on the wasted food issue for over 20 years now. And uh, there's been a tremendous amount of energy and momentum and activity uh, to address this, uh, especially in these most recent years. And we're really excited to be able to share the information with, with all of the audience today on the webinar about some of our experience, how we've seen the marketplace grow, what we know are, are services available across the hierarchy, but really focusing on here on donation today and, and hopefully share some, some insights that'll be helpful for, for all the attendees. Um, and as in a way of doing a little bit of framing here, uh, I think it's likely that, that most of us have seen this, but I think it is important, uh, it's always an important reminder that 
the issue of wasted food is, is a significant one. Uh, approximately 30 to 40 percent of, of all food that is, is grown and produced is being, being wasted um, in the U.S. And this is a tremendous, uh, has a tremendous economic impact um, and, a, and also a tremendous uh, environmental impact with, with significant greenhouse gas impacts. Um, but it also has a tremendous human impact and, and it is uh, kind of crazy to think that there's so much food being wasted while we have one in seven people across the country that are, are food insecure and, and, and wondering where their next meal is going to come from. And, and so uh, while this is a tremendous economic, social and environmental challenge, there, it also represents a tremendous opportunity to, to help address some of these, these issues. Uh, to this end, we, we've had some goals that have been set nationally uh, back in 2016. Uh, the USDA and EPA uh, set a goal to cut food waste in half by 2030 and, and definitely um, supports that goal and is, is, is working hard to, to contribute to, to addressing that. Um, so so while, while we have some Northeast examples that we'll talk about here today, and, and there's, a, there's a lot going on around the country, this is hap there's, there's a lot of efforts going on in sort of all corners of the, of the country uh, to, to make progress on this. And so uh, here I'd like to, to, to dig in a little bit on, on both the hierarchy and use that as a way to explain a little bit of the approach that at least we use in addressing wasted food. Uh, so this is the EPA's food recovery hierarchy, and right at the top where we have source reduction, which is preventing the, the food waste from happening in the first place, which um, has great economic and environmental uh, benefits. Uh, we'll be talking a lot here today about feeding hungry people and, and the opportunities for increased donation. Um, there's also feeding animals and, use, and industrial use as an opportunity, which is typically um, anaerobic digestion and composting, of course. Um, basically anything to avoid disposal. And I'll, I'm going to spend a minute on this slide with it back at the uh, full screen because the way we approach this, at least, is um, it's not necessarily a linear process. And our, our job is to really understand um, the service providers across this hierarchy because we don't, uh, the approach that we use, we don't providing these services directly. We're not a hauler or a food rescue organization or a composter, but instead we get to know all of those solution providers really, really well, understand their, their niche, their geography that they serve, what they need to have a good successful customer, and then armed with that information, go out and engage with the food waste generators, the commercial generators, and basically play matchmaker and help overcome barriers in the marketplace to get more of this activity happening. And so um, I wanted to share that as a context for how we get our work done and I'll keep moving through here and talk a little bit about what we're seeing uh, in terms of marketplace development um, in the region and, and nationally. And so policy is, is really developing. We've got that goal at the national level, but we've also got several of the Northeast states here in, in the NERC and NUMOA territories that are, um, have disposal bans on food waste, uh, but there's lots of different examples of different types of policy, and that sort of sets the tone in the marketplace. Um, and then we think about infrastructure development. I think traditionally when we thought about the issue, issue of wasted food and infrastructure, we've thought about composting, but as this has really gained momentum, we've seen lots of different types of infrastructure development, including uh, food rescue and, and, and food donation as an important part of what infrastructure really is. But there's also food prevention act activities and anaerobic digestion. All of that really represents infrastructure. And in the places where there are regulatory compliance, enforcement, we think, is, is also playing an important role um, so that the folks that are complying and have these kinds of programs have an even playing field uh, with those that don't. And it just sets, sets the tone again in the marketplace. And the fourth piece of this puzzle is the role that we happen to play, and there are many others that play this role as well, which is education and technical assistance. So that's that matchmaking that I was saying and really helping people find solutions and plug in, uh, but also overcoming barriers that are in the marketplace and just raising awareness in general about this issue. Uh, while it is our priority, we realize very, uh, very often that for, for a food business, um, this is not necessarily their priority, so it's our job to help make it as easy as possible to find a solution that works uh, for, 
for that particular business. And because of that activity, um, there's been a tremendous amount of growth. And each one of those puzzle pieces that I was just showing can work independently, but when they're working together, we're seeing the kind of growth that, um, that is happening right now in, in the Northeast states. And Vermont has seen about a 50% increase in, in donated food. And Massachusetts has seen about a 20% increase in donated food in these last few years. And uh, one of the things that's most exciting about that, using the Massachusetts example at least, is that much of that increase has been in the perishable foods, the most highly nutritious produce, meats, prepared foods, um, that are that are very very valuable in addition to like the more traditionally uh, donated shelf stable foods uh, but that's where that, that increase is really coming from and that's very exciting and, and important for for the populations that are being served um, so with that kind of background and what we're seeing happening in the marketplace I'll, I'll give a few examples and kind of dig in and, and the kind of work that we're doing and and what's the impact on the food donation side so uh, we are uh, Fortunate to be running the Recycling Works in Massachusetts program under contract to the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection. And so this is a statewide uh, free assistance program for businesses and institutions to uh, not just comply with the, those waste bans uh, for a range of not just food waste, but a range of materials that are banned from disposal in Massachusetts, but also to do so in, a, in the most cost effective ways possible and in ways that make good sense for, for whatever business we're serving. And the Recycling Works program has a very wide range of, of services, including a, a website, which is on here. I recommend you check out the lots of resources that are there. We have a, a call center that can help with over the phone assistance. We have the ability to go do direct one on one technical assistance. And then we do a lot of speaking like this to raise awareness and get um, uh, people to understand what those opportunities are and, and other services. And one of the things that we've, we've known that would be important as the food waste was banned, was coming into, into effect, was to help people understand, well, how much food waste do I even have? And what are the opportunities? And so we developed these food waste estimator tools, which are all available on the Recycling Works website for a, a, a wide range of industry sectors and um, it has lots of different metrics and ways you can calculate uh, this or at least ballpark where where you are and this is really important to just understand the whole universe of what you might be able to uh, tackle and and a, a good percentage of it often is um, donatable we're finding in the supermarket sector for example it's a big range but could be 20 or 30 or 40 percent or more even that's that's donatable um, out of all the food that might be currently be wasted so this helps us understand what that opportunity might look like in a big picture and, and develop a strategy to address it um, and one of the things that that we noticed in at around 2014 when the ban went into place in massachusetts was that we didn't know all the best answers for, for what are the best ways to get food donation happening. And so we developed, uh, we, we embarked on a, a, a best practices and stakeholder engagement process where we brought together larger food donors, food rescue organizations, as well as the public health officials and public health agents to build some consensus on what's the best way to do this. And the, the guidance itself is on our Wasted Food Solutions um, website, which I'll get to, but also on the Recycling Works website, and identified these couple of key areas where um, it's important to like look for what the food donation opportunities are. We developed some fact sheets that I'll get to in a moment. Um, there's, it's important to document the right procedures and make sure storage and temperature management um, are, are really well monitored. And, that, uh, and then to build good relationships with the partnering food rescue or, uh, organizations and make sure that the transportation capabilities match up well with what the opportunities you have. So there's a lot more detail um, in the guidance documents themselves, um, but that's like an overview of what we found in that process. And a couple of examples of how we provided some help and, and seen this play out as, as one is the Boston Public Market is um, a, an entity that came to us for some help and uh, we were able to connect them with Love and Spoonfuls, which is a food rescue organization, food and Food for Free, as well as the Greater Boston Food Bank. And just in their first month that they were open, um, they donated over 17,000 meals, and they're also composting 14, 14 tons, uh, compost of 14 tons of food scraps. And that's a great example of that going back to that hierarchy image where uh, entities can take a, take advantage of multiple steps in that hierarchy to have a really good comprehensive approach 
to, to addressing their, their wasted food. Um, another example is, is Fresh Market, is a supermarket in, in Connecticut that we've helped, and, and they were looking for help on, on uh, setting up food donation, and we connected them with FoodShare, which is a food bank there, and they started by just donating their baked goods, which is a pretty um, common approach to get started, and then they expanded to other foods, including produce, and they've now donated over 16 tons and 27,000 meals, and that's an ongoing program for that. Another thing that has happened um, and a good tool for, for folks to, to look into is that there's been a tremendous amount of innovation in this space in just these last couple of years. Um, all of these logos that you see here are, are new technologies that, are, that have come online that are very, very helpful depending on what sector you're in. Means Database, Food for All, Spoiler Alert, Food Rescue US, all of those are, are technology-based platforms that help um, increase the amount of donation that are happening um, in, and again in, in these different sec sectors that are helping in a very professional and uh, help uh, aided way to make those connections that, that facilitate much more food donation from, from happening. Uh, so I, I would recommend folks check out those resources to, to find ways to uh, increase their food donation opportunities. Another innovation and, and sort of a challenge that we found in the, in the best practices uh, process was was what to do about transportation that that, that uh, to keep food safe to keep uh, to get food to where it needs to be in a timely manner um, having the right transportation solution is, is often one of the, the key barriers to overcome and, and it has a provided opportunity for innovation as well and love and spoonfuls is a great example of a food rescue organization that's uh, that's based in, in Boston but has now expanded um, to other areas of Massachusetts, and I believe they have aspirations to go to go even further, where they're really specializing in this transportation niche, and they're they they don't even have a facility. They're taking food directly from donors to the recipient agencies, and but partnering with food banks to help get more of that activity happening, and they can really get some of those um, things that have a shorter shelf life to the recipients much more quickly. Food banks themselves are also innovating quite a bit. Um, we're very fortunate to have a project right now in Philadelphia, and we're partnering with Phil Abundance, which is the uh, food bank that serves a, a large portion of, of the greater Philly area and even into New Jersey. And they have a few um, different programs that they're really expanding their service, their Grocers Against Hunger program, which is partnering with over 200 grocers in their area to really provide more comprehensive services. Um, and they're also recognizing this increased opportunity for more more food and again that, again that more nutritious food but often comes in in smaller batches there's a lot of them they're kind of random they're not in predictable quantities and so they're partnering with some of those technology apps that i was mentioning a slide or two before and um and getting more of that activity to happen in a facilitated way where it might not even have to go to their their facility um, another example of, of some innovation is the city harvest in new york city um, has also recognized some of that transportation um, niche needs, and, and they've got uh, some refrigerated trucks now on the road that, that is helping address that issue. And they're they're moving a tremendous amount of food um, in, in the greater New York City area, and and helping feed lots of hungry people, and preventing a massive amount of food from from being disposed. Uh, I think that those opportunities and the technologies that exist and the different solutions that are out there. Are, are really great, but we need opportunities like this webinar and many others to get that information in the hands of the people that can use it. So one of the strategies that, that we've used, in addition to doing lots of speaking like this, is also to partner with um, the, the, the various association groups that, um, that could benefit from this information. So we've worked with Rhode Island and Massachusetts and Connecticut and, and, and many others to provide presentations and, and, and help connect their members to these solutions which we think is very important information sharing so that this issue can be on the radar and, uh, and for those uh, members to understand what those uh, opportunities are. So that's something that I'd be happy to talk more about and, and continue to do. This is an important part of getting the word out, I think. Um, I mentioned a little while ago that, that part of that best practice is involved um, creating legal fact sheets. And, and to do that, we partnered with the Harvard Food Law and Policy Clinic. And, and they certainly are the absolute experts on, on legal and policy analysis. Um, and we talked to them because one of the, the types of questions that we were getting were a lot around liability and, and, and 
we certainly weren't legal experts, so we turned to Harvard and they uh, produced these. And so they have liability protection that talks about the Good Samaritan Act, both the federal and state level. Uh, same for date labeling and tax incentives. And more recently, they've started producing ones even about um, getting food scraps to feed animals. And so uh, the map here shows um, the number of states that these legal fact sheets exist have been produced for or are in production for Pennsylvania um, and New Hampshire, I believe, are, are still, um, they're just about done. They're not quite done yet. Um, but there are a number of states that have these resources available. And um, in, a, in a slide or two, I'll get to where you can uh, find those. But I would really recommend, this is one of the most common questions we get from, from businesses of all sizes and types of, of what are the legal implications. And so there are some great resources that translate the law into some really just readable format that's helpful. Um, another form of information sharing that we found to be really important is working with the health officials. Uh, no food establishment wants to get in trouble with the health department. And so sharing this information and again, having that common understanding has been really important. So we've engaged with um, these health, health agent associations across the region to really share the same message and, and answer questions and get a common understanding so that uh, they can even be helping to facilitate even more of these donations from happening. So that's another strategy we've used that we think has been helpful and important. So uh, there, there, I've covered a lot of resources. Um, as an organization, we've been, again, very excited about the work that's been happening and, and uh, want to share uh, the experience and knowledge that we've gained in the work that we've been doing across the Northeast states and are now doing um, in many states around the country. And, and on our, our Wasted Food Solutions are, are all those resources and many, many more, lots of case studies and tip sheets um, with some state-specific information, but also we have a toolbox that's really got information that's uh, applicable no matter where you are. So I would recommend you, you check that out and you can always give us a call if you have uh, more questions um, after taking a look at those resources. So um, I hope that the, the information I've shared and those examples and the, the innovations that are happening have been helpful for, for the attendees here. And, and I look forward to the, to the rest of the panel and, and answering questions in our, our question and answer period. So I, I thank you and, and Nirk and Numo for the, for the time and opportunity to share today. Thank you so much, Lorenzo. Great presentation. Thank you. Um, um, now it gives me pleasure to introduce our next panelists. Um, we have Sherry Stevens and Nick LaChapelle from Hannaford Supermarkets. Um, for the past 31 years, Sherry has served as the customers and served the customers and communities of Northern New England for Hannaford Supermarkets. She is the primary contact for Maine and New Hampshire community groups seeking sponsorship or donations from Hannaford Supermarkets, as well as for Hannaford Associates working to build meaningful relationships with their local communities. She helps maintain Hannaford's charitable activities so that the focus is primarily on those programs that benefit child development and families, health and wellness, and food insecurity. Prior to this role, she managed customer, consumer affairs for Hannaford's parent company, Del Hayes America, and held a wide variety of other positions within the company, including roles in transportation, human resources, category management, and at the stores themselves. Nick LaChapelle has worked for Hannaford for the past 20 years and has held many roles within the company, such as fresh operations specialist, produce man merchandising specialist, store manager, and department manager. Nick is currently the store manager in the Brunswick, Maine location and has been the Fresh Rescue resource for the state of Maine for the past year. At the Fresh Rescue in the Fresh Rescue role, Nick works closely with Good Shepherd Food Bank as well as Hannaford stores in the state of Maine to improve Hannaford's food donation processes and practices at the retail location. And it's a, really a great privilege to have such experienced um, folks joining us from Hannaford, and we really appreciate their, um, you know, their presentation and learning from people on the ground. Before I turn it over to them, I want to um, urge participants to post questions in the question box in the GoToWebinar uh, control panel. We um, really want to hear your questions, and we will moderate sort of a Q&A at the end of this presentation. So Sherry and Nick, thanks. Great, thank you, and we're really excited to be here today. So um, I work, as Terry mentioned, on the community relations side, and Nick is on the retail side. So we thought, for
for this particular presentation, it would be really impactful for the two of us to, to kind of team up. So we'll go slide by slide through what we have here and happy to answer any questions in the end. Uh, it's really, we're really particularly proud of this program and the impact that we've had on our communities with it. So with that said, I'll hand it over to Nick. Awesome. Thank you, Sherry. So anytime we get to talk about food, uh, it's always a great topic. Uh, so definitely uh, really appreciate being here. Uh, so we're all food wasters, uh, right? I mean, uh, maybe we buy too much or prepare too much or order too much at our favorite restaurant. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about uh, and share with you about Hannaford, uh, how Hannaford handles good quality product uh, that uh, no longer really saleable to us. So uh, who we partner with and uh, where uh, we get our guidance from. And before we do that, we're just going to talk a little bit about Hannaford Supermarkets and our roles. So uh, Hannaford uh, is a 181 uh, store chain based in Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, Massachusetts, and New York. It's a full service supermarket based out of Scarborough, Maine, employing about 25,000 customers, uh, associates, uh, focused on best in class fresh. So best in class fresh is important to our food donation story as we work to offer high quality foods in our fresh departments. That often means that foods uh, that don't meet our quality specs are not uh, offered for sale. We need to find a way to move through them. So being a part of our local communities is really important to us at Hannaford, and, and we invest heavily to keep communities in our five states healthy. As Terry mentioned, we're focused on three areas, health and wellness, child and family development, and hunger relief, which ties the hunger relief rises to the top uh, quite a bit in our organization because it's an easy tie to our business. Our standard logo is just the cornucopia itself, but a few years ago, we we created a separate Hannaford Helps logo that we use for the charitable giving side of our business. In this picture, one of our store associates is passing donated food to a local pantry representative. So Lorenzo did an amazing job detailing why reducing food waste is important. And it, it is a serious issue with significant environmental and economic impacts. So we have this massive issue of wasted food while there is real need right here in our own communities, people in our local communities who are struggling with food insecurity. So Lorenzo uh, actually touched on the EPA food recovery hierarchy uh, pictured here a little earlier. So uh, we use that and uh, as a guide for ourselves as well. Uh, so I won't go into too much detail around that, but the shape of the hierarchy implies that you should get more of your recovered food to the step in the top triangle than the bottom, uh, which with the bottom being sent to the landfill. So obviously source reduction, we work on operating our, uh, our businesses to minimize any type of shrink we can, but it's part of our business. So anything we can do uh, uh, potentially after that uh, item is no longer saleable in our stores, we go to feed the hungry. Uh, food, uh, food waste goes to animals. Uh, as well as industrial uses. Uh, we, we actually uh, partner with a company called AgriCycle in the state of Maine, and uh, we do a lot of composting as well. Um, so aside from ensuring that we don't create the food waste, we put our focus on ensuring that all food is safe, edible, uh, and we can't sell, uh, really goes to alleviate that hunger in those food pantries and those food banks that we, that we partner with. So uh, we don't do this alone, as we as we said. Uh, we kind of we partner with a number of experts in our food donation work. Uh, Feeding America is a big partner of ours, uh, and their network of food banks and affiliates help us to get our donated food distributed safely and fairly throughout our footprint. So my store in Brunswick, Maine, we actually partner very closely with the uh, Mid Coast Hunger Prevention uh, Program, uh, which is actually uh, literally a neighbor of uh, of my store. So we uh, definitely partner closely with them. So our food donation, sorry about that hesitation there. The food donation process for us works like this. Um, food that is no longer saleable in store for various reasons. It could be just a, a reset, a product reset in our stores or um, you know, any number of reasons that product, that center store product or shelf stable product um, is no longer saleable. That is sent back to our product recovery center um, in South Portland, Maine, um, from all of our stores. Um, our, from there, the, the product recovery center di distributes that food directly out to the food banks, 
but they're sometimes they're picking up at the product recovery center or we're distributing it with our trucks. The distribution centers as well have product that may not have passed inspection or for, again, other reasons. Um, so they are, depending on the type of product it is, if it's shelf stable, they send it back to the product recovery center um, or they food banks may be coming to our distribution centers to pick up as well. If it's perishable food, we want to get it because we're um, in, from a, looking at it from a timely manner. We're trying to get that food to those food banks and distribute it out into the communities as quickly as possible. Fresh rescued products from our stores don't go to the product recovery center. They're distributed directly from our retail stores right out into our local communities. So we've identified agencies around each one of our 181 stores uh, to distribute these products out to. And they're, they're arriving at our stores every morning, uh, usually between 7 and 9 a.m. to pick up food, the, the perimeter, foods from those perimeter departments, the fresh departments, produce, deli, bakery, meat, uh, seafood, um, dairy, all of those fresh products are uh, distributed directly into the communities. So here's a visual of the fresh rescue process itself. Product is scanned out, put in boxes, and then distribute it out, as I just explained, um, to the Fresh Rescue partners each morning from each store. It's a very successful model. The food is donated um, directly to the local agencies. The food banks provide training and technical support to the agencies. And we also support them with refrigeration and educational materials for clients, often through our in-store dietitian program. The food banks provide us with data uh, that allows us to monitor the amount of food that we donate, and it helps us to identify opportunities within each store to make sure that we're donating all that we can. We also use that, that um, data to celebrate pounds, um, points of pride throughout our organization. So the next slide that Sherry's going to be bringing up uh, Sure, it really tells the story, uh, which this is a fantastic story that we're able to share. So in 2018, we recovered and donated over 25 million pounds of food across our network. So this is a 7% increase over the previous year. Um, we can continue to identify areas for improvement in this program and do not believe we've actually hit our ceiling uh, yet in terms to 100% program execution in all stores. So the graph uh, shows a positive trend that we've experienced really after formalizing our food donation program that rolled out uh, in 2014 uh, and definitely highlighting the tools and the practices we, we currently have. So um, how do we do it? We began with creating a mission statement, uh, which you see in front of you, uh, safe and fair distribution of donated good quality foods seven days per week at, uh, at risk neighbors uh, to at risk neighbors in our local communities, uh, which is really uh, definitely a strong statement to say. We knew that in order to be successful, we would need strong partnerships and collaboration within and outside our business to build this program. So to kick it off, we gathered analysis and input from experts to support the work. We knew um, that we had an opportunity to make an impact in our communities, but we also knew that we certainly were not experts in how to do that. So we reached out to you know examples of that were Feeding America and, and our local food banks. Um, we also had to create really strong internal and external partnerships. You know, we, we needed engagement within our organization with retail leadership and operations and uh, PR and communications to support us through that. The sustainability team is a huge partner in this process and the tax department. Um, external partnerships were, again, those food banks and their agency relations and food sourcing teams and the hunger relief agencies local to our stores. And we had to create tools. It was important to have um, tools that create an overview of the program and the support, the touch points for, of, of the process itself. 
Um, all of these tools are saved to our intranet portal for any associate to re um, access and review at any time. So the, the tools themselves, because this is just a snapshot of some of them, or I'd say probably most of them, it's uh, reference documents, uh, letters to the agencies that we created early on, a why document, which is a common document that we have internally that explains the, the whys and hows of each program that we roll out, department posters in each stores um, for each department that kind of guide them through the process, standard practice training aids, um, a, a core tool within our organization that, that speak to the department breakdown, pro, the program process and scan out procedures, we have tip cards for associates. Uh, they're just small cards that they carry in their pockets that, again, give that overview of the program and the key points of it. Backroom posts so that our associates in the back room, at a quick glance, know who's picking up, what they're picking up, and when they're picking up uh, for products each morning. And ID cards for our associates in those back rooms to identify representatives from the, the organization from the local agencies, and those are provided by the food bank. We also have a spreadsheet that we update regularly that uh, shows us a, a snapshot of each of our stores and the current partners that we have. And you know, as Nick mentioned earlier, we're it's a seven day a week, 365 uh, day program. So when we have gaps in that program, we work quickly to try to fill those within each community. And here's just a few, uh, I guess, visuals of our, some of our tools that we have. We have our monthly dashboard uh, that we use to identify uh, stores that are doing uh, great work, uh, as well as stores that are uh, still have a little bit of work to do and, uh, and have opportunities in their processes. Uh, so we kind of utilize those to uh, as a place to go, uh, take a look at, and see how we can fine tune our process in each store. Uh, we'll get into a little bit more later, but there's a hierarchy that we use as well. Um, also on here, there's a daily donation and handling procedure, which is a simple flow chart for every associate that's uh, working inside each fresh department to be able to follow and determine whether or not they can actually donate it, sell it, uh, or discard the product. Um, obviously, uh, like we've said, based off the EPA uh, food uh, hierarchy uh, triangle, uh, we, we want to be able to donate it first. So uh, we definitely use this as, uh, as a tool for everybody as well as uh, our monthly um, fresh rescue donations that we receive through our, our food, uh, food banks that we partner with. Uh, you know, we have here just one that we get from the state of Maine, uh, the Good Shepherd Food Bank, which kind of gives us pounds uh, donated by every single store uh, in, our, in our banner uh, and allows us to kind of figure out where we have opportunities and where we're doing really well. And it allows us to, uh, I guess, celebrate where we're doing well and as well uh, kind of turn the, turn the needle up, uh, you know, when we have to. So sustaining the pro the program, um, you know, we kind of talked about this a little bit. There is a, there is a hierarchy we utilize. Uh, community relations plays a large process in this, which Sherry is part of. Uh, she provides support uh, to the below roles uh, when necessary. Acts as a liaison between Hannaford and the food bank agencies. We have state fresh rescue sponsors, uh, which make decisions that may impact labor and priorities in retail operations. Uh, state Fresh Rescue Champions, which my, myself, I am one of them. Uh, we refine action plans to ensure optimal success for fresh rescue programs in respective states. We have our district fresh rescue resources, who I work closely with to kind of get the information and give guidance and uh, answer questions when necessary. And we have our store champions, which is usually a store manager. Uh, and then the store community stewards, which we have one person or two people inside of every store that, you know, kind of partners uh, inside their store as a champion and kind of goes around and, and helps people and guides them and monitors the program. So to continually reinforce the program and to motivate our associates to bring the program to the fullest potential, we really had to create these uh, within each of our five states. So we built the infrastructure for a sustainable program, and we also understand that to keep that fresh and sustain, we have to keep the conversation going within our organization. So we keep our executive team engaged um, by sharing results with them. We look for opportunities continuously in this program uh, using um, the tools that, that Nick mentioned earlier. And we motivate ourselves. Um, we set a corporate goal to cut our food waste in half by 2030. We take time to celebrate the milestones and successes of the program. And we create team building and community events 
It's um, not uncommon for our store associates to be at the food banks volunteering or gleaning from gardens in their local communities that serve or, or support hunger relief. Uh, we do monthly progress reports. Nick showed you a visual of those earlier. Monthly updates for the store community boards. So we're, we're posting our results at, on the community boards on a monthly basis. We do huddles in our stores to uh, talk about the program. <clears throat> our experience, so we want every associate in our organization to have a basic understanding of our food donation program. Our experience has been that once they understand it and the reasons for it, they're inspired and motivated to participate in the work. We see that over and over again. So uh, having, having all hands on deck and everybody coming to the plate to support the program has, been, um, has helped to make it very successful. And there are benefits, um, so many benefits with this program. Um, the first bullet that we have here is the most important benefit of all. We're feeding hungry people. And I have that in orange because orange is the color for hunger awareness in the U.S. We've strengthened relationships with our local communities um, in a huge way through this program and um, created greater awareness of food insecurity both within our organization and externally as we talk about our, our food donation program and the reasons for it. And our couple we know that our customers care and expect corporate responsibility from us and we and they are voicing to us that we are meeting their expectations through this program. Uh, associate morale and retention, we, um, we know that we're impacting that. Our associates are, are, are voicing a huge sense of pride for this program and um, so we know that we're, we're impacting their decision to work for our company through that. Uh, waste reduction, besides better inventory management and tactics to avoid shrink, donating is the best option to prevent good quality food from becoming wasted. Vermont and Mass have already implemented food waste bans, so uh, donating reduces our costs and keeps us compliant. And positive business impact, little or no incremental labor. Um, it's, a, it's a quick, simple decision for those associates in the produce department as they're culling that produce. Would you eat that apple? If you would, it goes in the, in the box for the donation. If not, um, they, it would go to compost or uh, not compost animals. Um, we follow the high, they follow the hierarchy for it. And the cost savings, we've experienced a million dollar annually cost, uh, waste cost avoided um, through waste, through avoiding waste cost a million dollars. And there, yes, there are tax benefits. We, um, there, because there, there is a limit on the amount of the deduction, um, we reach that pretty quickly. So this doesn't really end up being a huge factor for us, nor was it a motivator for us to do this program. So with that, we'll just say thank you for having us. Uh, we really appreciate uh, being here and be able to present for this. Uh, and I wanted to kind of call out that we are happy to share this information and our learnings with any organization that was looking to do this. Uh, it's definitely uh, been very valuable for us here at Hannaford uh, and definitely are willing to share uh, anything we can do to help you out or anyone else out uh, that might be looking to do this as well. Thank you so much, Sherry and, and uh, Lorenzo and Nick. Um, I, we have a question that one of the participants has raised. Um, I know I have some questions. I hope maybe Lynn, you've got some questions. But to begin with, and I think this is more for you, Sherry and Nick, um, can you share more about ongoing education to, with employees to ensure maximum donation? So, so I, I, I can share. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I can, I can share essentially uh, we, we do we actually partner with a, a, a portion of the corporate office called the CAE team uh, we do uh, huddles uh, you know uh, every week uh, essentially and one of the topics that we bring up uh, at least periodically I'd say every other month or so has been fresh rescue or uh, or food donation processes uh, so we do that as a company uh, and that gets that that message out there uh, to all the associates that uh, join in our huddles um, on those times, as well as uh, 
like I said, that community steward uh, who's who's in the store as part of that hierarchy that we discussed um, is going around and kind of coaching people on that, educating people on the processes. Uh, we have a lot of standards that uh, allow us to just kind of print it off and, and hand it out to people and allow them to talk through it. Uh, so it is, it is a constant thing. Um, I mean, where it's a seven day a week um, program, uh, it really is something we talk about almost every single day. Thanks, Nick. Sherry, did you want to add anything or, or Lorenzo? Uh, yeah, just to add one quick little point is we actually, um, because we are so um, driven by process within our organization, we actually created standard practices, um, standard practice training aids. So there are monthly standard, tra standard practice training aids that that steward takes um, and, follow and follows processes where he's walking through departments on a monthly basis, checking in, um, reminding each department um, of, of the, the aids that, that support this program. And then there's an annual uh, store walk that comes up every January that all, with a much more robust um, review of the program for all store associates. So we we built that in to make sh to make sure that it it was um, done consistently and um, ongoing for the program. Okay, thank you. We have two questions that are kind of related. One is, do the organizations that take time to set aside food for rescue see any reduction slash prevention of food from being wasted because they are more aware of what is being captured? for rescue and other management methods? And how has Hannaford's worked to reduce the quantity of food they don't sell to minimize the amount of excess food? Yeah, I would say uh, at this point in time, um, we're actually experiencing uh, record setting shrink numbers for our organization. Uh, it's really not seeing any um, major uh, I guess shrink issues at our store uh, based off of those numbers we're seeing uh, or through the company even. Um, we're actually experiencing great results in that aspect. Really what we're doing uh, is more or less making sure that that, that food hierarchy uh, is being followed uh, and that's allowing us to, you know, I guess make better decisions and make sure that we're putting that food aside for, for food banks and pantries uh, versus uh, ensuring that it's uh, not going to the waste stream. Uh, that's really our major major focus at this point in time. Yeah, as we as we continue to hone those shrink uh, our shrink, which will always be a focus for us in the organization, we're we're not seeing that um, impact this program. If anything, we over the as, as the graph showed through um, the deck um, early on, it's we continue to see those numbers go up as we as we make sure that we are donating everything that we possibly can. So while shrink is going down, the donation numbers are going up. So when you say shrink, that means shrinking the amount of weight excess food that that goes that isn't sold. Yeah, it's, it's essentially uh, I guess what would be food food waste, uh, you know, at that point in time, but majority of it is is going to to our food pantries uh, versus uh, you know potentially going in the landfill which is again mm -hmm. the whole the whole goal of the fresh rescue work so yep Lorenzo do you want to add anything about you know source reduction for food waste sure sure uh, I think that that it's in our experience at least it's been pretty common uh, when working with uh, hundreds and hundreds of businesses that we, we've worked with that that when they start on one of the strategies uh, using donation as an example here of, of just really paying attention to what is being wasted and having a process uh, as the superstar Sherry and Nick are doing uh, at, at, at Hannaford's uh, of, of separating and actually seeing what it is it, it opens up lots of opportunities um, across the hierarchy and especially for prevention uh, I think that that seeing what's there and and employing those shrink strategies uh, that that Sherry and Nick were talking about and, and many others just help illuminate the opportunity to prevent waste from happening in the first place and whether it's changing storage or ordering practices prep practices meal prep um, or, or using some of those um, those technology tools that I was mentioning to to aid them in measuring and tracking that all of those become much more clear uh, oftentimes when when a strategy like donation is employed. And it doesn't mean that 
less donation is happening, like like uh, like Sherry Nick have mentioned, um, it just means really taking a deeper dive and looking at it more closely. And and, it, and sometimes it just becomes more obvious that there are those opportunities. And so uh, in our experience, we've, we've definitely seen uh, prevention being driven by those other types of activities. Thank you. Um, next question is about, is there a means of downloading this presentation from the Hannaford website? And I've switched to the NMO website where we do, we have posted these presentations and we will put, be posting uh, probably in the next few days, the recording of this webinar. Lynn, are you planning to post this as well on your website? Uh, yes, we will, as well as the recording. Okay, and so you know we can let people know where that is. Um, Sherry or Nick, are you have you posted this on your website for the Hannaford website? I uh, know we haven't. Okay. Okay. All right. Well. So now you know where you can find it, and then in the MO website or the NERC website. That's where. And I don't know, uh, Lorenzo, you you can you could post it on the CET website if you wanted. Yeah, um, I would look into like linking to yours, um, so that's all in one spot. And but we can point to it. I'd be happy to, to work on that. Okay, great. Um, another question that came in: Can Hannaford's talk more about their diversion for animal feed and composting? Is it occurring at all stores? So uh, the composting, it, I guess it really depends on uh, proximity to, to AgriCycle, at least, uh, you know, for the state of Maine. Some of the more rural areas uh, that may not have uh, a, the company being willing to drive there, uh, maybe doing more of the, uh, the pig farming. Uh, is, we have donations that we sign uh, with local farmers uh, that they come pick it up uh, daily, sometimes every other day. Uh, and that's why we utilize that as a as part of uh, um, our process uh, because it eliminates food waste again going uh, into the waste stream. So, if you want to touch more on that? Yeah, it's one or the other or both options yeah. in all stores, I would say. And I'll just add that that's pretty common, I think, especially um, with chains that, that have a significant footprint um, over a large geography that, that, that what is food, truly food scraps and food waste that needs to go to either composting, anaerobic digestion, or or animal feed. Um, it doesn't travel very far, and so it's it's a matter of plugging into the the, the locally available infrastructure that uh, makes the most sense for the particular generator and particular location. So um, many many chains have have multiple solutions based on what's available. And I will say that we do uh, get several um, actual pig farmers or, or local farmers that come to the store on many occasions and just ask if they can do that. And uh, by having the tool that's there uh, with our food donation agreement that we that we're able to sign with them, uh, we kind of are able to, to help them out and it helps us out at the same time. Okay, one of our participants asks, they would really like to have the flow chart for various departments. Is that possible? And I assume what they mean by that is, you know, as a separate document, perhaps, because they can get what you presented. But it sounds like they're looking at um, something more than, you know, more than what they can see on the slides. We are happy to share any of these tools with anyone. So if you want to forward uh, contact information to me, I can pop that in the mail to them, or if you want to share my contact information out, Terry, I'm happy to, to pop that in the mail okay. to anyone. Okay, thank you. If you send me a, um, say, a PDF of that, we could post that on our website as well. Okay, yep, I will do that. Okay, thanks. Another question is, do you audit the quality of foods donated to ensure that you are donating quality, healthy, meal-building foods to your community. I know pantries and food banks sometimes struggle with getting surplus breads and pastries from grocers rather than protein and nutrient dense foods they would prefer. So we definitely uh, we definitely do. Um, one of the tools that we showed on the slide though was a uh, spreadsheet we get from uh, Good Shepherd uh, Food Banks, which is uh, one of the food banks that we partner with locally. Uh, you can see on that spreadsheet there's actually some highlighted uh, red uh, columns that actually are showing the bakery uh, area. So what we're doing is uh, we're utilizing those spreadsheets and getting uh, getting actual stores to, to take a look at their other departments as well uh, and focusing more on the, the produce uh, and saving the produce calls throughout the day 
uh, as well as dairy. Um, you know, we pull dairy two days before it goes out of coats, so we can still donate it, as well as focusing on uh, freezing uh, meat items uh, before it goes out of coat. Uh, you know, that's that's really what we're doing to try to turn that up. And to, uh, I don't think we're stopping uh, donating baked goods, uh, but it is something we're trying to focus on all the healthier items uh, that are available to us to be able to donate to those areas. And, and I would just add um, that we stress continuously in this organization that our food donation program is not a waste diversion program. So um, we, we encourage our associates to make careful decisions. And again, using that filter, would you eat it? Is it, is it good quality food and would you eat it? And, it's, and you know, Nick touching on that best in class earlier on in the slides was that the purpose that we called that out is that's often what's happening is, is our consumers have a very high demand of quality, uh, high quality demand when they walk into our stores to buy product and we we understand that and want to offer that to them so the average customer will not pick an apple that might have a small nick in it nothing wrong with that apple and so getting that if we're culling products like that getting that into the hands of people in our communities that could um, that are struggling with food insecurity is really important but but being careful not to be putting food out there that has a short short life to it or um, is not consumable. That's not, that's not acceptable. I would add, uh, I'll point to, to one of the resources that are available um, on, on the Recycling Works website uh, at recyclingworksma.com slash donate. That's where all the best practice information is. And, and there's a couple things there that really help, I think, make sure that, that, that quality and food safety are, are front of mind. Um, there's sort of a, a, a templated agreement between a recipient organization and a donor that helps make sure that there's a shared understanding of what kinds of food uh, products are, are acceptable and, and can be handled, um, as well as some transportation and just sort of food log examples so that there's good record keeping and tracking of what's being um, provided for donation that helps make sure that the right kinds of material of food food products are being uh, donated and and that there's there's some quality assurance uh, there so those are freely available resources and sort of template documents that can be um, just d downloaded and used hey Lorenzo if you want if to navigate there I can make you the presenter and you can you can show those resources while we're dealing with some of these final questions that people have posted okay Sure. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes. So um, maybe this is a quick question. If you haven't, what considerations does do, does Hannaford take to prevent meat contaminated food from being fed to pigs, um, and what happens to meat contaminated waste if not going to AgriCycle? So we, we also uh, partner with an, an agency, uh, at least in the state of Maine, called uh, Baker Commodities, who do a lot of our rendering, uh, and they they handle most of the meat the meat items. Okay. Outside of composting, so. So you should be able to see now the resources that Lorenzo mentioned. Yep, this food, our food donation page is up, and um, down here is some labeling document examples, and we've got here uh, this the, the agreement uh, template and the transportation log. Um, and there's lots of other resources um, on here as well, including the legal fact sheets. Um, this is the Massachusetts example, so so there's lots here, and, and that hopefully everybody can see the URL at the top, and um, and you're welcome to go use it, no matter where you are. <laughs> Thanks, Lorenzo. One final question. I hope we can spend a well, minute. Can, can, can Lynn butt in for a second? Yeah, go ahead, Lynn. Sorry. Lorenzo, do you have on your website the state organizations that the Hannaford people referred to about? I apologies, I didn't. It was a new phrase to me. But it was like the state level um, rescue associations. Uh, I'm sure I'm butchering what he what he referred to, what Nick referred to. Um, but I hadn't heard of those before. Of course, I'm not helping because I'm getting the name wrong. But maybe Nick could chime in and correct. But I'm wondering how we would find out about those. Are you talking about the the hierarchy we discussed? Well, you referred to being personally involved with a state resource okay. group yep. and a local. Re so first of all, what what were they actually called? So that that's uh, that's more uh, internally here at Hannaford uh, than, ah, than anything, okay. but 
Uh, it's okay. just the hierarchy we've established uh, to kind of keep this topic going and keep it fresh and uh, keep uh, keep driving uh, even right. a little bit further. So thanks, thanks for the clarification. Okay, one final question that someone um, posted: Do you see these programs growing in the future? And if so, what resources would you need to grow them? Uh, the fresh rescue, our food donation program, growing. I assume so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we definitely don't do not feel that we've hit the ceiling on this program. Um, we can first of all, we continue to add offerings in our stores. Um, right now, we're exploring. We have kitchen um, prepared foods, and you know, we so we've had like for example the rotisserie chickens, and the uh, we we can donate those if we put them through a cooling. What's it called? Net cooling yeah, it's, process. It's essentially, they need to be. They get chilled, cooled down to the proper temperature. And if they go out of date, we'll actually freeze them uh, and uh, and donate them to to uh, pantries. So. All right. So we're looking at, um, as we continue to add offerings in our stores, we are always looking at whether or not we can donate foods from um, from those offerings if, if that's available. Um, and Again, diving deep within each department continuously and educating, educating, educating our associates on the to and to use the tools and make sure that they're donating all that they can. In 2018, we, that was a seven percent increase. Um, that's that's been pretty much um, after the first year we had a significant increase, but we've seen a really steady trend upward um, consistently, and I. I do expect to see that over the next few years. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think uh, just just beginning this work a, a year ago, I think we've got a, a lot more work to do. I mean, we've we've seen 25 million pounds uh, as of 2018. Uh, I think we can improve upon that and continue to grow on it. Uh, we're expanding on stores uh, periodically, uh, so I mean that just only continues to grow that uh, the pounds donated as well. Um, so I think there's definitely some some more work to do. Uh, and uh, we're going to continue to push along for it. I would uh, just add on that I, I think that that's a very com another common theme that that we're hearing across the the different businesses we work with in in, in a variety of sectors that that engaging in donation uh, usually un un unveils ad additional opportunities and um, and I think that that we're seeing this across various sectors as well that that. Um, I think many supermarkets have have been doing some donation for a long time, and and the example that, that the folks from Hanover just shared of how much growth there's been, we're seeing in many different uh, uh, supermarkets as well as uh, other types of food businesses. And I think that this is kind of the tip of the iceberg, and there's a lot of opportunity um, to to get a lot more good, healthy, nutritious food into um, the hands of, of those who need it most. I think we've run out of time, um, but and I, sorry, I think we we didn't get to every single question. Um, I think we covered a lot of the topics that uh, we we did get questions on. Um, again, I want to thank all of the all of our presenters, Lorenzo, Nick, and Sherry. Um, this was excellent, and uh, I want to thank um, NERC for partnering with us on this webinar and and uh, helping to plan the webinar. And uh, please. Uh, avail yourself of all the resources that um, we've been showing you today, and we want to wish everyone on the call um, all the best with all your food donation activities. Thank you. Really happy to have participated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been great.